to welcome Tawny Newsom to what I'm just going to call Captain Chat because I'm wearing yes. a Captain and I'm pretty proud of this whole Captain situation I've been rocking in my mid 40s. Um, so we're just going to go with Captain Chat. But Tawny is a musician, she's an actress, she's a comedian, she's co host of the amazing podcast Yo Is This Racist? Um, she co stars in Space Force, which is brilliant with Steve Carell and John Malkovich. She played Chelsea Lately on Bajillion Dollar Properties, which is one of my favorite shows that so few people have watched. Honestly, watch the show. <laughs> CISO died. I don't know what happened to it, but you've got to be able to find it on Prime or something. Um, you can find it somewhere. Well, we're doing all the credits. I love this. Hey, cause basically I stalked you for a while, so I figured it would be a good time for me to just get out all of the knowledge I've accumulated about your life, including the fact that you're in a band called Lost Souls. You've re released your fourth album. Um, Star Trek Lower Jet Decks, which I want to talk about because I'm not a Trekkie and I need some advice on how to become a Trekkie because no one has yet really given me that, that, that push. So I'm hoping you can do that for me. And I definitely can. Just to, you know, just to, just to tie it all up in a nice little bow, your eyebrows make me want to be a better person. <laughs> <laughs> And that, honestly, like all the credits aside, that is the compliment I'm here for. Right. That is what makes me get out of bed in the morning. Um, thank you. I don't need an Emmy. I don't need an Oscar. Just eyebrow praise. Eyebrow thank praise, you so much. Eyebrow praise, right? You could be an eyebrow model. Just like, ugh. Anyway, so welcome, Tawny. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I did want to say that I, I saw your Instagram post about the wildfires, and I know they, they're affecting so many people. And I just wanted to say I'm really glad that you and your husband are safe, but can you talk about how that has affected you and, you know, maybe your views on climate change in light of the fact that <laughs> everything is on fire? Yeah, no, thank you. We are safe. We got really lucky. Um, I live in a really rural mountain community um, in Southern California. So, you know, where we live, it's not like... Um, uh, it, this sounds flip, but I'm saying it's not like a whole town burned down, but I say that because uh, the, the attention on the, the amount of lost property is just less because there are so many fires devastating so much of the West Coast. But for me, our, our tiny little micro community just, and I'm not even there, I'm in Atlanta, so I'm trying to get this info from like the internet and our little community council. The, the impact for me personally is really huge, but I'm very aware that it's something that people are dealing with all up and down the west coast um as far as my views on climate change wouldn't it be wild if this just like changed me and made me a total idiot right-wing person who was like actually i don't think it's that bad <laughs> like what an insane position that would things, be things burn you know it's like a cleansing you know, process maybe your little a, you know, community you know, just needed to be cleansed yeah you know uh, mother nature goes in these cycles it happens every 20 years it's it's always done it like i i hear these arguments and i'm like you're you're an insane person i come from generations of californians i was a child in this state yes wildfire has always been a thing but never never to the extent that we've seen in the last few years it's truly devastating um yeah so just trying not to freak out or wake up crying about a very specific tree that <laughs> was on my land that's now gone just trying to get through the day like that <laughs> yeah i mean that special specific tree was important i mean i feel like in this day and age people feel like they need to apologize in a lot of ways for feeling how they're feeling because this pandemic has us all screwed up just mentally emotionally physically and it's like i know i get this sense where everyone that i i'm close to is alive and healthy for now and, they're, and I work at home, I'm basically an introvert, so not a whole lot has changed for me. So sometimes I feel like, do I even have a right to be upset? But we all do, you know? I think we all have a right yeah. to be upset about what's going on in this country right now, no matter the degree to which you are affected by a specific thing, because we're all people, and especially those of us who come from marginalized communities, you know, you're black, biracial, I'm black, sort of biracial, adopted, it's a whole thing. But like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> There, we all have our little intersections where we're affected by different things. And I just feel like everyone should know you don't have to apologize for feeling some kind of way about your situation, even if someone else has it so much worse. Because the likelihood is, is if you're watching this right now, you're an empathetic person. And so you're doing what you can to help other people. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. You know, what's interesting is that the night that um, RBG passed, 
was the night that I was really like I was watching the fire maps and it and it from the fire maps I could just tell that it was just on my property it it looked as though my house was gone it was like there's no chance um so I was really feeling conflicted because I wasn't properly able to mourn and think about what it meant for our country to lose Justice Ginsburg because I was so consumed with my personal loss or perceived loss and that has me real fucked up because you know, just I want to be an empathetic person who is able to process and move practically and move forward and do things to help this country and to help our people and to help our community. But I was so stricken by my own shit that I was like, oh, no, now I can't be aware of all the ills of the world, which is a wild thing to think. I should have just stopped and been more, I don't know, kind to myself, I think. And I think that's important. I mean, I- you know, being kind to yourself. That was actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about. But first, I want to ask you about something that I heard you talk about a little bit on the video. And you said that you and your husband, Nate, are doomsday preppers. I didn't know if you were joking (laughs) or if you were serious. But like, I have some friends who are sort of in the process of buying generators and getting a Winchester rifle and like preparing just in case something horrible, you know, we actually end up where it seems like we are marching towards. And I feel like there are people who need to get ready. I've got trans friends of mine asking me, do you think I need to get ready to leave Texas? Because things are really bad. And I'm like, yeah, you do. Because better to be prepared than to be slapped upside the head when you know the militia comes marching through your town all of a sudden. So I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, it was a little bit of a flippant comment. But so our story is that we've been together now 10 years. Um, My husband grew up on a Christian commune in Ohio, like a very hippie, 11 families all living together. You cash your paycheck, you put it in a jar, everyone splits everything type family. And it was really a positive experience for him. I grew up on a horse ranch in Northern California. Um, very, not enough money to have the amount of horses that we had. So it was always kind of like struggling to keep animals fed and stuff. Um, But we both just were raised by very like do-it-yourself, self-reliant parents. And so we always knew we wanted this rural property. And I think, you know, five, six years ago when we were living in Chicago and we were thinking like, God, we just got to get out of city life. I did it for 10 years. I love the cities, but... What I really want is to just be completely self-reliant. I want like, if there's a natural disaster, you know, this is me six years ago, just guessing. Like if there's a natural disaster, I wanna have my own power, my own water. I just wanna be self-sufficient. And never in my life would I think that the year 2020 would give me such, such opportunity to really exercise all of the things we've always been kind of prepped for. We're not gun people. We're kind of like the most pacifist doomsday preppers, but like, yeah, we have 5,000 gallons of water. Yeah, we can, you know, we have solar generators. Like, there's not going to be power where my home is probably for another three weeks or so. But my husband's out there. He's just going to live on the land. And, you know, it, it's a little weird. When I first left L.A. and moved out there, I had a few friends that were like, how do you get Postmates? What do you do? But now, after this pandemic, I think everyone's like, you did it right. This is the only place to be. So, so can I come live with you when? Please do. <laughs> We're starting a commune. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just We're scoping gonna... out different situations. I know a lot of Black people are making a lot of plans. I'm just trying to, yes. just trying to RSVP to different places. So we you know if I come Actually, walking in with my dog. <laughs> oh, perfect. Oh, and you have a dog. Okay, great. So I'm gonna put you down on security detail because you know everyone on the commune has to fill a role. So you already have. You're the legal. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 Legal. Consigliere. Yep. Okay, and you're going to be security with the dog because we have healthcare people and we have a lot of entertainment covered. But um, <laughs> the entertainment sessions are going to be on point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the jams, the jam sessions, the sessions oh, at night yeah. are going to be so tight. I'm just going to bring all my Oakland people down there because we got great people up here. It's just going to be we're just going to be living, and then the the country around us can just collapse. My plan yep. is to have like an abortion clinic slash dog rescue situation yes just sort of like a way stop for people like pregnant people who need abortion care like that's my jam you know before that is it gonna be called like like hang on to the kids you want (laughs) (laughs) you don't like take a kid drop a kid we're gonna have like a take a kid drop a kid jar you know so if you got the Mm -hmm. one let's go drop this one over here it's gonna be very progressive very very progressive 
I'm into it. We have the space. Um, it is a charred landscape now, so as long as that doesn't bother you. Oh, I God. I'm, I don't mind it at all. Um, so I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about Brianna Taylor. Um, and I know you're in, the, in Atlanta now, and I think you've lived there. At least you lived there part-time, maybe? I, I shot a show here two years ago, so I was here for two months, and now I'm here for another two months. Okay. So. Yeah. I just, you know, just I'm just wondering if the vibe in the South when it comes to this just travesty is different. If you could have, if you, you could share, I, I just get a sense that there are a lot of people watching on Twitter and who have thoughts and feelings, but don't really know what it's like when you're down there because the South is a different place. I lived in Atlanta for a while and it just, there's mm-hmm. a different vibe there and the black people have, there's a different community there. And I don't know, I'm just wondering if you have sensed any, any difference or that you could share at all. You know what's strange? Um, So I'm here working, and in order to go back to work, the studios and the networks have been so, so, for good reason, very strict about COVID protocols. So we are completely isolated. Like, we are... I'm probably not supposed to like talk about their protocols, but if I don't tell you what thing I'm doing, no one will care. Um, But like we're tested like every 48 hours. We're not supposed to see, I have other friends in town shooting other things. And even though they're tested every 48 hours, we're not even supposed to like go on walks together. They're really like, so I am in this hotel room 23 hours a day, unless I go to set. I go for a walk for one hour. So it's been weird. But what I will say, so I probably don't have the greatest pulse on on how the city is feeling. But what I will say is that the amount of black people on our set, on our crew, in our cast, just, you know, our transpo vans, it is so different when you work in Atlanta versus working in Los Angeles. So I have been so grateful that when this terrible verdict came through, I was surrounded by black people, five generations of black people around me at all times. And it just, I don't know how I could have weathered it on a regular Hollywood set, to be honest, Um, because, you know, when we can just kind of look at each other and be like, did you see it? Yeah. And you don't, you don't have to say anything else. Yeah. 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 So I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard because I have friends who aren't particularly tapped into this, friends who live in L.A., um, and it's just, you know, and non-black people, I understand why they wouldn't get that visceral pain from what's going on. I get it. I mean, they can empathize, but it's not going to really sit the same. And so it is difficult to try to have conversations with people for whom it's not sitting the same and to just talk about regular stuff, you know, like what you saw on TV or what yeah. you ate for lunch. I'm just kind of, I end up retreating into my little shell. And then I have black people who I end up talking to in order to form that sense of community that you were able to have, you know, in Atlanta. So I think that's really important. Um, and I'm yeah. just going to ask this question. Do you think white people are tired of Black Lives Matter? Ooh, honey. <laughs> Ooh, honey. <laughs> You know, some of them started tired of it. Before they'd even heard of it, they were tired of the idea it represents. Yeah. Um, what yeah, I mean, I like progressive that... people or people who are, you know, white people who are in your circles who you would consider friends. I just get the sense that there's this, after a while, there's a fatigue that sets in. And I just, and I don't you know, know what to do about that. I think you're right. It absolutely is fatigue. There's fatigue for this whole year from a lot of things. So I think I think there's two types of tired, right? There's the tired that's like, gosh, okay, well, we marched and we did the thing, but now can we, like, they've made some changes. Can we just go back to normal? You know, those are kind of like the moderate people who are just not really in the fight with us, who are just trying to appear like they are. But then even for the super progressive people who we know and love, there's a fatigue of like, an, an empathetic like oh I just wish this would be over for you like it I think it comes from a place of kindness but it is like a I just wish this would stop because it still is they, they want it to stop for us but they're still centering their discomfort a little bit even subconsciously we all do it you know we want people I, I feel like that's why a lot of ableism exists because we want everyone to be as able and as fortunate as as we are and so we just have this like oh I don't know how to treat this I don't know. That's just an observation I've been making where I'm like, people are tired of this, but it's not because they're assholes. It's because they don't know what to do with these feelings. And we've grown up with these feelings. Right. And I guess, you know, I'm wondering, like, you know, I, I was listening to one of your most recent podcasts and you and Andrew were talking about 
like what it is that white people can do when this fatigue starts to set in. And I think one of the things you mentioned was, you know, just like the people who are hard, there are still people who are hardcore marching every day and have been for months. And so I feel like, you know, those people really need to be protected. I mean, Andrew made this really awesome point. Like in Ferguson, people didn't start disappearing until the media stopped paying attention. And so that's sort of what happened mm-hmm. in Portland. You know, they just started yoking people up. And so I don't really know. I don't, I certainly don't have any answers, but I would say, you know, if you start to get tired, just, just keep pushing. Cause if you think you're tired, imagine how tired we yes. are, you know? Yep. And there's always, like, I think about this sometimes when I don't know what to do to support those people, you always have a friend that is 10 shades or even three shades more radical than you. You always have somebody that you're like, whoo, Lisa has been out every day just breaking bank windows. I even forgot we were still marching. Like, you have a friend who is out there. Even if you don't know them super well, these are the people that you are not only allowed to reach out to, not to pepper them with questions, but like to just reach out and be like, how can I support what you're doing? That's all you have to say. And they could be like, yo, my buddy needs a ride so that we can blah, blah, blah. Or they could be like, we need water dropped off here. Or it could be something completely different. But like, if you don't know what to do, there are people who do. So just ask. Right. And that's just the easiest thing to do. Just be like, do you need help? How can I help? And the same thing goes for, you know, my wheelhouse, reproductive rights. And when it comes to getting people abortion care, there are abortion funds. There are people who you know, we'll take, we'll we'll, uh, do travel arrangements for people. And rather than sit and wonder, well, what can I do? Or try and reinvent the wheel, just find those people who are doing those things and just ask. Because I'm telling you, there is no person who is out there, you know, balls to the wall, ovaries to the ceiling, like marching and like trying to figure it out, who wouldn't want some help. You know what I mean? Even if it's just, can you send me 10 bucks for lunch? You know what I mean? Just, you know, so I, I would just, I would just encourage white people when you think you're tired, ask someone who you, who is still out there and just see what you can do. You might even not have to get off the couch to help. And, you know, and that's great because, you know, that's the other thing that I, I think of a lot about when it comes to these protests is I have serious anxiety disorder, borderline agoraphobia mm-hmm. at times. You're not going to catch me out in the street in the middle of a crowd of people marching. That's just, I have too much anxiety for that. And I feel like people need to be need to recognize that not everyone is able to go hard in the same way, but there are always lanes. Mm -hmm. You can always find something that fits with your personality, that fits with your politics that you can do to move the needle forward. So just, you know, find what that thing is. Yeah. And like, I'm always saying, you know, people are so tapped out from like, you know, fundraisers and GoFundMes and whatnot. I'm always like, if you don't have funds, sharing something does a world of difference. Like every now and then I'll go and look at a GoFundMe that I've like retweeted or whatever, in the comments, I'll see someone who I don't know who's like, I think I got this sent to me because of something Tawny Newsom posted, but uh, you know, whatever. And like, that makes me feel so good. Like I'm responsible for this $10 just because someone happened to see it. So even if you have a small following or no following or whatever, if you can't, yeah, if you can't afford to support all these causes that you like would like to, just sharing it can help. It can make such a huge difference. Um, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I really did want to ask no, you. No, I want to talk to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're like, I'm bored. <laughs> I never get to, like, I'm what, am I doing? what am I doing? I told you I, I can't leave. I can't leave. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you about the Jessica Krug situation. Ooh. And that, I mean, first of all, like, I don't want to shade any of the black people who came across her path at any point during this charade. Yeah. Because I know what it's like when you kind of have some questions about somebody, but mm-hmm. you know you don't want to black check someone or be that person who questions identity. So you kind of keep it to yourself, even though you're kind of mm-hmm. like, are you, are you sure you're not just white? You know what I mean? Like we've all seen <laughs> those people. But like generally I'm the kind of person, you know, there's no one way to be black. I was called, you know, Oreo my whole life going up. My mom's white, my dad's black. So I'm about as white as I am black. I mean, it's just, it's a mm-hmm. mixture. And I really do feel that there is no one way to be black. We're not a monolith. I don't like questioning black people's credentials. But on the mm-hmm. other hand, you look at a picture of this woman and it's like, <sighs> what? The lips. How? Imani, the lips. The lips is what she got She had me. no lips. None. Like not very a lip found. <laughs> How do you smoke a cigarette without cutting it in half is what I want to know. 
I'm sorry. Now I'm just being mean, but like I, I mean, that's she just a characteristic of black people. We have lips. That's what the, they draw the cartoons of the racist cartoons. Right, the same are lips. It's all big red lips. So how is this woman getting by with her little her Kenneth Branagh lips? Like I don't understand. Oh no, not Kenneth Branagh. <laughs> I mean, but I like, love to your Kenneth point. Branagh. The man has no lips. You're, you're, hey, you're, you're preaching the choir here. But to, to your point, like, you're right. Even that is a form of, like, could be seen as a form of black checking because, like, there are, there are black people, full ass black people who probably don't have lips. Probably and we don't want to deny their experience. But it is, it is odd to me seeing a picture of her. And of course, it's easy for me to be like, now that I see her and know the story, to be like, y'all are fools. Um, yeah, I feel sad every time I'm made aware of one of these people because they have to be some sort of bizarre minority. Um, I have known people who have passed for things and it, I, don't, I, I, I don't know, but not to the extent that we're seeing now. And I think just like social media loves to run with the story because it's like, first of all, it's you know fun for people to dunk on. So like comedians like me and people on our side of things love to dunk on a story like this. But it's also like it also feeds the other side. Like weirdly, folks on the on the other side love to think of it as like an L for progressives. They're like, ha ha, see one of your smarty woke people is actually a lie. And it's like, no, we don't want her. We right. don't claim her either. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I do think it's unfortunate because I mean, as a mixed person, yeah, I mean, I've been black checked my whole life. I mean, I grew up riding rodeo and I play in a punk band. So like, there's no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no limit to the amount of black people just looking at me and just calling me different. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I don't want to know that she exists. I also don't like that. I have to know I don't, I, I don't, I said this on my podcast that I don't like that as a lay person who's not in academia in any way, I am not an alum of Wash U. I, I have no connection to her world other than being a black person. I shouldn't know where she worked, what department she was in. I, like uh, this scandal that has been inadvertently brought on this university, she should have dealt with this privately. She could have come out to her staff, been disgraced in her professional life, and just move, just go to Kansas. Just go, go be white, be white. Kansas. Just go be white. Why? Why is there? A, why is there a story about you to where I'm now looking at those black people in that um, department and, and thinking anything about yeah, them? Right. Right. Like my dumb ass shouldn't know. I'm over here in Hollywood. I should not know your name. So I said this on my podcast to any of the other uh, race imposters out there. <laughs> I don't want to know who you are. Keep it to yourself. Go make yourself a mayonnaise sandwich and leave. Just get out my face. Oh, mayonnaise sandwich. Uh, yeah, I, I, I read that. I, I read about half of that self-flagellating nonsense, and I was just like, "Girl, come on!" Like, I can't. It was just, it was so overwrought. And as soon as I read it, I was like, "This chick's about to get outed," and she thought she'd get out in front of it. And the most, like. You know, you can see her whipping herself, and it's just like nobody, yeah. nobody wants that. Just be like, no. I fucked up. I shouldn't have done this. Here's why. Here are some black scholars you should be reading and talking to. I'm gonna go move Thank my you. white ass to Kansas and yeah. try to be a better person. You know, I like that we've decided. Was she from Kansas, or did we just decide this I think for we her? Just decided she has to go to Kansas. I think it fits. Just go to Kansas because. That seems like a place where you could go and you could be like, oh, hey, why'd you move here? Oh, I was uh, a race imposter. And they'd be like, <laughs> they'd be like oh, come over too, here. We got, a, <laughs> we got an area of town for y'all. Come over here. We got <laughs> cheap rent. <laughs> you can go and just de-black and then you'll just come out a white person. You'll feel better. And then you can just live your truth. Right. Start listening to like Kylie Minogue. I sh Why am I shading Kylie Minogue? I love me some Kylie Minogue. I don't know. Let me stop. Kylie Minogue <laughs> is great. You know who else is great? Her Danny Minogue is also fantastic. Oh, she really? only took off in Europe. I also think like not to keep going on this too long, but like I, as like I mentioned that I've been in a punk band and like an alt country band for like uh, on and off for almost ten years. The number of quote white spaces that I occupy that with very well intentioned, sweet, progressive other white people, but I'm still like questioned or thought of as like, oh, wait, why are you here? Or there's some assumption about who I am when I'm there, always assumed to be the backing singer, always, 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 always. That the fact that I have to just like walk through that world and be like, no, this is what I like, this is what I'm doing, and just like 
own myself and own my color and everything else. Like, why couldn't, why can't these race imposters Do that. just own the shit they like, own her African American studies that she's so good at, and just be like, yeah, I'm the white chick who knows a lot about this topic, and that might be weird, but and that's fine. Let's I just have deal one with of it. My, my, one of my best friends from law school, white guy from the Midwest, went. You know, he is now a professor of like Rhodesian history from like 1967 and 1969. Like he's got a very specific, like he studies <laughs> co- colonial Rhodesian history. White as hell goes to South Africa and goes to these conferences and hangs out with black people and he just walks like a white man through a black world who knows a hell of a lot about this particular subject. And that's fine. You can go and get a PhD yes. in whatever the hell you want. And as long as you treat that subject with some sensitivity and you are intelligent, which my friend is and does, then it's fine. I don't it's understand. Fine. It's just this idea that you have to wear somebody else's skin in order to understand what's, or to pretend that you understand, because the likelihood is you're never going to understand. So you're wearing this skin and almost in order to sort of foreclose any further investigation into your own feelings about something. You know what I mean? Like if you're a black person, you're probably gonna feel some kind of way as a black person. But if you're a white person trying to figure out how a black person might feel, you're not interrogating the right stuff. You just put it on skin and then going out and talking in a black scent, a very bad one Oof. at that. Like, bad. A really bad one. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand any of it. I'm also, part of my brain, it keeps turning over. Why are we seeing more women, people who identify as women doing this, than we are men? And is that because uh, people love to pounce on women more? Maybe. Maybe there are just as many men doing this. But there's something in my brain that's like, what is it about cishet white women that need to grab some other marginalization? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we should I'm ask not them. a psychologist. <laughs> Maybe we should have like a race <laughs> imposter conference and just gather them all up and just, just, just talk yeah. about their feelings. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it's just us focusing more on women because we love to tear women down as a, yeah, you true. know, <laughs> It's just easier, it seems like. But yeah, that can be your next caftan talk. Is just um, talking talk to, to, talk to, to white, white race imposters. We'll just turn this into a whole Jerry Springer situation. <laughs> yeah, be like, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't have that much, that many more questions for you. I just, you know, I just really wanted time. to thank you for taking the time out of your very busy day of sitting in your hotel room <laughs> to have this conversation. Yeah. Um, it's really, really great. Thank you so much. I do have to move from this chair to that chair. I mean, that could be a whole experience. Netflix, so. You could change, change your makeup, do your hair, oh, just walk four feet, you're right. sit down. I might try that. All right. Liven my day up. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you so much.